Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Adobe Live. Happy New Year. Welcome back. If you've been watching the Adobe Live streams, welcome back. Happy New Year. Hopefully you got some good time off or some good time with family and friends or just some time doing other things <laughs> than watching Adobe Live. All right, so with that said, um, for those of you who are new, <clears throat> my name is Terry White. I am the photography evangelist here at Adobe. It's my pleasure to stream to you once again on a Friday, beautiful Friday morning here in Atlanta. And uh, today's topic is gonna be 10 more things you probably didn't know were in Photoshop. Maybe you knew, maybe you know some of them, maybe you didn't know any of them, maybe you knew all of them, but that's today's topic one way or the other. So with that said, um, for those of you who are new, this is a uh, weekly thing we do on Fridays where the Adobe Evangelist Myself, um, Paul Tranny, Jason Levine, Howard Pinsky, uh, Kyle Webster, and Katrina, we all get together and we stream our various disciplines, uh, which could range anywhere from Photoshop to photography to digital painting and design, graphic design, audio and video, and more Photoshop. <laughs> so with that said, uh, happy to be back and looking forward to another year of good content. Uh, to provide to you guys. All right, so if you're just one housekeeping rule, if you're watching this somewhere else, I see people chiming in on YouTube and Facebook. Um, and I'm sure people are watching on, on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. If you're watching in all those places, that's great. You can hang out and watch there all you want. But if you want to participate in the main chat, because I won't be able to pay attention to all the chats, if you want to pay attention to the, or you want to participate in the main chat, head over to b.net slash Adobe Live. That's where I'll be taking, or that's that's where I'll be taking questions, but that's what the one I'll be looking at the most. I might see you over there, uh, Rick, and Rick says good morning, and Mitch says good to see you again, Terry. And uh, so I, I might see your comment over there, but I'm gonna be mainly be looking at this window. So if you wanna make sure I see your question or comment, or maybe one of the moderators sees it and answers it, head over to there. Head over there, you don't need to buy anything, you just log in with your, free Adobe ID, which you can even do with social media. Okay, <clears throat> so for those of you who didn't see last year's topic, 10 things you didn't know were in Photoshop, you can go back and watch that one after this is over. They're, they're, they're not, like, it's not a series where you have to have watched the first one to see this one. You can watch them independently. Um, but what I did was I just found, at the time, I found like 20 some odd things that were kind of obscure, Maybe people knew about them, maybe they didn't. And some of them, of course, most of them I try, I thought were pretty cool and that you should know about. So I put together a list of like 20 things because sometimes I don't know, like I'll say 10 things and I don't know if I have more time than it takes to cover those 10 things. So I put it, you know, I'll do 11 or 12 or 13. So in that case, I put together 20 and it was like, oh, stopped right at 10, right at the, at the time uh, our time was up. I thought, well, I got 10 more cool things. Might as well put those in another episode. All right, so with that said, and hopefully we uh, end on time because I don't have 20 more. I just have like 12 more. All right, so with that said, uh, let's go ahead and dive right in. I'm going to clear my voice one more time because I, I sound a little rough here. Let's do this one more time. <clears throat> All right, there we go. That's better. Okay, so now let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, let's pop over to my desktop. I've got an image open. Um, most of the images I'm gonna open or show you today, I would say 80% of them you probably haven't seen um, because I, I just try to pick some newer images that I, I'm, I'm tired of recycling the same images. I'm tired, I'm sure you're tired of seeing the same images, but a lot of times you'll see um, <clears throat> the, the you know an image works so perfectly you can't help but use it so that's why you see presenters use the same images over and over again all right so let's got let's get into this first one so uh thing number one is there's a hidden set of keyboard commands that allow you to visually adjust not only your brush size but your brush hardness and softness so uh you can do that all in one Fatal swoop. So um, we all, you know, most of you already know if you have a keyboard with bracket keys, because I have to say that because 
Not everyone's using a US English keyboard. But if you have a keyboard with bracket keys next to the letter P and you're on a brush, so let's get to a brush first. Let's hit the letter B, get to the, there we go. Get to the brush tool. And I can um, use the bracket keys to make my brush bigger or smaller. Okay, so that's, that's a given. That's been there for decades. But what's, uh, what hasn't been there all the time, but has been there for a while, but people still, because it's so hidden, people don't know. So for example, if I want to um, use my Content Aware Healing Brush, and I want to make it bigger or smaller, well, I can still use the same bracket keys, great. But if I hold down, and I have to sometimes look at the command myself, the Option or Alt key, and the Control key, and click and drag. When I drag left and right, that will make the brush bigger or smaller and also give you a readout on what the diameter is. So left and right, just dragging the mouse or whatever stylus you're using to make the brush bigger or smaller visually. And notice it's a super soft brush. If I drag up or down, down makes it harder, up makes it softer. So left, right, up, down. So down makes it harder, up makes it softer, Right makes it bigger, left makes it smaller. So you can get all of that in one mouse movement or trackball or wheel or whatever it is you're doing uh, or stylus, which I highly recommend. And then once you, get, once you let go, the brush is that size with that softness and you can go ahead and of course start using it. Um, so that's my first one. Um, will you record the video to watch later? Unless something horribly goes wrong, all the live streams are available to watch later. So you just come back to the same link and it'll be there. Unless something technically went wrong. <laughs> so I don't have to do anything extra. All right, <clears throat> next one, that was number one. Number two is a window command for arranging your windows. So you'll notice that I've got several documents open in tabs. So I can uh, easily click between the documents to get back and forth, that's great. But um, sometimes people want to be able to see more than one window at a time or one, one document at a time. So under the window menu, under arrange, you've got all these different options for tiling your windows. So for example, if I say uh, two up horizontal, that will give me two documents up horizontal. If I say um, window arrange tile, um, two up vertical as you would as you would expect i get two up vertical if you go in you can say all of them so tile all of them vertically so then you you get this which is not very useful when you have a bunch of documents open unless you've got a 57 inch wide monitor then that would probably still work <clears throat> and then you can also go um four up what, you know, basically you get the idea. Whatever you choose, that's what it's gonna put your windows in. Then when you're done playing with getting things side by side, when you wanna get them all back, you can go ahead and say consolidate to all tabs. But the thing I would be remiss if I didn't show you is that you also have some different options here once they're tiled. You can match the zoom level so that they're all zoomed at the same level. And whether that's 100% in this case, 33.33%, whatever it is, you can do that matching. So don't just stop with the tiling. Also come down here to um, control your, um, your zoom levels. Um, you can have windows float, and so they're not in a tab, all kinds of options there. But when you're ready to go back, you just say consolidate to all, all windows to tabs and that'll put them all back. All right, uh, so that is number two, window arrange. Just remember you have window arrange to do those kinds of things. All right, next up, and now that put everything out of order, which was what I was afraid of. Let's see, I think it's this one, okay. So next one up, um, this is one I've shown before. So this one you probably have seen if you've been watching me for a while, especially if you've been watching me on the design side of things, because a lot of times, um, we have, I'm being rescued with some water here. Hang on. Thank you. I just don't know how this cup works, that's all.
Oh god. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times you'll have a photo with some text in it. So the Las Vegas sign, uh, you know, how many, how many years old is this sign? And it has uh, different fonts. And, and some designers might go crazy with the number of different fonts today. Like they would think, oh, no, this is bad typography. But I'm not here to judge the sign. I'm here to show you a feature. <laughs> and that is, especially if you have something that's photo like photographed and the type is um, hand hand drawn, like it's like like the fabulous, for example, that's probably a font, but it could have just as easily been drawn by hand as well. Now the two in the Las Vegas and the Nevada, that's you know most likely an easy font. But the welcome is also, um, that's neon. So was that from a font or was that from hand lettering? So you can have things that are fonts. You can have things that are hand lettering. And if it's hand lettering, obviously someone drew that from scratch or a stencil. And they don't necessarily have a font that you can go replicate that with. So as you know, as part of your uh, Creative Cloud subscription, you have access to Adobe Fonts. And with Adobe Fonts, you have tons, like thousands of different typefaces. Now that doesn't mean you're gonna be able to match every typeface that you ever see in a photo, but what you can do is at least get close to it if you don't match it dead on. So for example, I would love to type the word fabulous in something close to the Las Vegas fabulous. All right, so what I wanna do is uh, I type the word fabulous just in a generic myriad font. And you can see it here on its own type layer. Great. And then I'm going to go ahead and leave the type layer selected. But I'm going to go to my rectangular marquee tool. And I'm going to just make a rectangular marquee around the word fabulous, even though I'm not on that layer, even though I'm not on the background. I'm just going to go ahead and make that selection. Okay, great. So I got my selection made, but I'm still on the type layer. So that way I'll get to preview the different fonts it comes up with on the word that I type. So that's the trick really. Type the word in the same, you know, same word that you're trying to match. That way you'll see how close you are because some of the letters may look great. They may be dead on. Some of the letters may not be the same. Like in this case, I'm probably not gonna find that B in fabulous, but that's okay. As long as I can find the letter F and the other letters and get close, I'll be, I'll be fine. All right, so let's go to the type menu. Under type, you've got this thing called match font. When you come down to match font, that will um, start a search. Basically, ba see what it did? It made the rectangular selection a different kind of selection. And it then went through, number one, it went through all of your fonts, the ones you currently got loaded. And then it also went out to the cloud and went through the rest of the Adobe fonts for ones that you don't even have loaded right now and saying, Okay, these might work too. Now again, there's no guarantee that this is gonna be dead on. There's no guarantee that it's gonna be the right font. But at least it'll get you close, maybe in the ballpark, and maybe it will be right dead on. All right, so let's go ahead and click on this one. Nope, that's, uh, that's too thick, so I wouldn't use that one. And, and nah, it's, it's like, it's not the same feel. Okay, same thing. Not the same feel, and again, too thick. Getting there, but still not it. Nope. Nope. Although that's getting there. And that's not it. So if I, if I don't like any of the ones that are here, however, and if, let's say these were all I had, this would probably be, if I spread that out, this would probably be the closest one to me. If I make it a little thinner and spread it out after the fact. Yeah, the rest of these I'm not really like a fan of. I'm not a fan of that, not a fan of that. But these are kind of close. Okay, if there's one that you don't have loaded, just click the little cloud download icon and that will go ahead and activate it and show it to you. Now, I knew that would probably wouldn't be it because it was in the same family as this uh, Duos brush. 
But here's one, uh, the CC sign language. Let's see what this looks like. Nah, I'm not, not a fan of that one. So if I had to pick one of these, it'd probably be this one. And again, with some tweaking in Photoshop, like spreading, like um, expanding the text out a little bit, that would be probably as close as I'm going to get. So just so you know, you can go in and get these, uh, these typefaces to kind of match or get close to what you have selected in Photoshop. So just a quick check, a quick way to match a font. All right, so if I click OK, now those other fonts are still loaded. I still have all those other choices. Now I would start, I would begin the tweaking process to uh, at least expand that out a little bit to make that look closer if I was really trying to match that and thin it out. All right, but anyway, um, match font is number three. Number four, let's see here. My images are not in order anymore. Let's go to... We did that one, not that one yet, not that one yet, this one. All right, <clears throat> let's zoom out or zoom in. And if I, if I zoom in on her eyes, we can see that this image is pretty sharp. Like, good job on me for capturing a nice sharp and focus image. But just because an image is sharp and in focus doesn't mean that it's as sharp as you want it to be in certain areas. Like I, I, I'm a fan of, of portraits with really sharp eyes and sharp jewelry and sharp a, or, or accents that make the image pop even more. Now, again, looking at this image at first glance, it looks great. It looks as sharp and in focus and everything's great. But one of my favorite tools that has been in Photoshop pretty much since day one, definitely in the early, early years, but in the early, early years, it was awful to use because the algorithm, the, the technology behind the tool would destroy your image. And that tool is the sharpen tool. So I've got it pulled out here on my tool panel, but your sharpen tool will be under the blur tool, sharp blur, sharpen, and I think um, sponge, I can't remember. No, there's like three, two or three tools together. I, I've separated mine out a long time ago. But just go to your sharpen tool, which is, like I said, is under your blur tool. And you'll notice in the top um, options here, there's this checkbox that's checked by default, and it's a beautiful checkbox. You want to keep it checked. It's called Protect Detail. Because without Protect Detail on, it's the way it used to work back in the 90s and the early 2000s. It was horrible. So I'm going to show you how bad it was first, and then I'm going to show you why we, why we hated using it. Like you, you might get away with one, one pass with it. And that's it. If you went beyond that, this is what would happen. And I'm exaggerating it, but that's why we hated that tool. Because it would literally just start destroying your image after the second or third pass. So <clears throat> it was kind of one of those tools, use sparingly, use on a duplicate layer, lower the opacity. Like you would just don't use it too much or you're going to get this. It's going to just like totally screw up your image. So I'm going to just go ahead and revert the image back to the way it was. There we go. <clears throat> and now we're going to go ahead and turn on the project detail. Like I said, you don't ever have to worry about turning that off. I can't even imagine a reason you would want to turn it off unless you're trying to destroy an image for a special effect. <laughs> That's the only reason I could think to turn it off. But it's on by default. You never touch it. Just leave it on. And then you can get more than one pass out of it. Now, I'm going to do two, maybe three passes. So one, two, that's about it. Like I, would, I could go three, but that's too much. So I'm going to undo that last one. So two passes. And actually, let me do it. Let me do it back and forth as one stroke. Once, twice. Okay. So now it looks like it's sharper. I can see it already. And then when you undo it, your image almost looks blurry compared to the amount of sharpening you just added. So sharpening is a key thing we do to photos that make them pop, make them stand out, especially if you're going to print them. Because when you print an image, you lose some of that sharpness just in the printing process. So you might even slightly over sharpen or use output sharpening when you're going to print because of what's going to be lost in the printing process. Um, 
So when do I use this tool? Whenever I'm doing a portrait retouch, I'll do the eyes. So two passes on the eyes. I might do the teeth. Just get those a little sharper. If the person is wearing any jewelry, bracelets, necklaces, earrings, I'll sharpen the crap out of those. Like, because like you see, I'm doing multiple passes here and it's just, it's not destroying it. And again, all of that is just going to make it look better. Now let's, uh, let's show you a before and after. Let's go. Um, let's revert this one more time. That's the whole before. Let's duplicate the layer. Oop, duplicate the layer. There we go. And then we'll just do everything I just did. So a couple times on the eye, a couple times on the eye. There, I see an earring hanging out over there. And I would zoom in, make my brush smaller, do a better job. I'm just doing it quick to get through this right now. Let's see, go down here, get this all nice and sharp. And again, I'm spending more time on this because I can. Like it's not making it worse, it's making it better. So things like jewelry, you can really do a lot with. Okay, so now I've got the before and after layer. So uh, if we zoom in and we do before, that was before, that's after. Look at the difference. So just that, that sharpen tool is gold. See, see what I did there? It's gold. Anyway, um, just that. And if we go up and look at the person, might have been able to get away with one pass, but two pass didn't make it worse. So, uh, and then if we go to the earring, I think I only did that once or twice. Oh yeah, look at the difference there. Now again, I went outside the line, so I was getting some of the background, so you'd zoom in and do a better job. But you can even see what it did to the earring just there. So it's sharpening on a brush, which is great because you can pick and choose what areas you want to sharpen with. All right, next up. Um, and that was number four. Number five, I need that guy, this guy. All right, number five, we're going to do, um, we're going to do a technique that's been in Photoshop probably just as long as the Sharpen tool. It's been there forever, but a lot of people use it once, try it, don't like it. It's inflexible, it's old, and then you're like, why would anyone ever use this? And it's, it's again, because you're you're not, you don't know the workarounds for being that old. All right, so it's a filter. So first of all, we're gonna create a new layer. And we're gonna fill that new layer with black. So I just hit the letter X to toggle my, um, my foreground background color to black and white. And then I'm gonna hold down my Option or Alt key and hit Delete or Backspace. And that will go ahead and fill that layer with black. So the photograph is underneath that black layer. Now, the reason we do this, the reason you create a new layer is number one, number one, it'll give you the flexibility to move around the effect that I'm about to show you. Number two, um, putting it on black and setting the blend mode means that you can put it anywhere. <laughs> it's funny. Funny Reverb might call him Fabio, and that's uh, you're going to see me do something in a few minutes, but that's the exact name I came up with too. Anyway, um, Black is going to let me do this filter because you have to do it. This particular filter can't be done on an empty layer. There has to be some pixels there. And once you see me do what I'm going to do on black, you'll see why I chose black. Okay, so filter menu. Render, been there forever, the lens flare filter. Now, when I bring this filter up, just the UI alone will show you how old it is because... It's, it's back in the days when filters didn't preview on the canvas, like we don't see the, the lens flare on the canvas, we see it in this little tiny window that you can't make any bigger, you can't, you can't make the window size any bigger, you can't do anything with it. That's the way filters used to be. Now newer, more modern filters either preview directly on the canvas or they got a big giant filter window or workspace to work in to do all your options. So this is kind of like what I would call a legacy Photoshop filter that probably could use some updating. But Photoshop team, of course, prioritizes what people are using, things they need, and apparently not enough people are using the lens flare filter to give it some love. But I don't know, maybe we start a petition. Anyway, <laughs> uh, first and foremost, you have four different lens types, uh, 50 to 300 millimeter zoom, 
30 millimeter prime, 35 millimeter prime, 105 millimeter prime. Oh, I like 105. And the movie prime. Um, and once you pick one, you can move it around. And again, you're not seeing this on the image. You're not seeing it on the canvas. So you have to imagine what it's going to look like from this window. You can also increase the brightness. So you can make it a, a solar flare or just a, um, a lens flare. You can turn it all the way down. So I'm going to put it right about 70 something. There we go. And then once I click OK, click OK, that will put the lens flare on my black um, layer. And that's it. Like you, you lost all ability to go back in and move it around. You lost everything. It, it's like permanently added to that layer. However, because I put it on a layer, number one, I can move the layer around. And number two, I want to see this lens flare on my subject. So by putting this lens flare on a black layer, all I got to do is change the blend mode to screen. And that will screen out the black and just leave me with the lens flare. Now, oh, I couldn't see his hair. So now I don't know the lens flare is not in the right spot. Well, I'll just switch to the move tool and move it around because it's on its own layer. You can put it anywhere you want. You can do anything with it what you want. You can scale it down, scale it up um, and put it exactly where you need it to be to get the effect that you want to get. So um, if you're, especially if you're shooting an uh, outdoor portrait and you want to kind of add like a cool special effect with that uh, lens flare, go to town with it. Because if you just add it to the image, now let me show you the difference. Let's turn off the right one and let's go to the background. And let's say you would have applied the lens flare to the image. Well, number one, because you're on the image layer, when you go to lens flare, render lens flare, you are going to get to see it on the image. So great. You're going to get to see it. You can see where you're putting it. You can see what it's going to look like. Okay, so that's cool. You can see if you need it to be brighter. And maybe you do this first uh, just so you can get your settings down. So like, for example, I said I like the 105 millimeter prime, but maybe not so bright. But then once you click OK, that's it. You can't move it around anymore because you put it on the actual layer. Even if you duplicated the layer, you still can't move it around anymore because it's like back in the old classic Photoshop days, it applied those pixels permanently. So that's it. I, it's there. I can't do anything with it. I could only uh, hopefully undo it. Or if I did it as a smart object, I can you know turn it off. But I can't go back in and readjust it. So that's why we make that separate layer for it to, to be able to control it after the fact. All right. So let's undo that one. Turn this one back on. And again, this one wrong layer. This one can be moved around because it's on its own layer. Okay, uh, so lens flare is one of those, especially if you're new to Photoshop, it's probably one of those things you hadn't seen yet um, and hadn't got around to. All right, next up, let's go ahead and, yep, 40 years of Adobe. Let's go up and uh, this one is number one, two, three, four, five, six, number six. Number six in my list is search. Um, a lot of times, especially with Photoshop having hundreds of options, maybe thousands of buttons and presets and, and sliders and things you can adjust. It's like one of the most, you know, deep tools that we make. It's got so many different layers and, and abilities and so forth and so on. So you might know, well, Terry mentioned this thing called a sharpen tool. I don't know where it is. I don't see it on my tool panel, but I know it's there because he said it's there. You might hear about something in Photoshop and just not know where it is. And rather than go Google a tutorial or go Google it, Photoshop's got its own kind of search technology built in. So if you go to the magnifying glass in the upper right hand corner, whenever you forget where something is or, or even maybe you didn't forget, you just never knew how to use it. Nine times out of 10, the search will help you get to what you want. So if I type in, uh, let's skip the tour. If I type in sharpen, there it is. So the minute I type sharpen, I see all the different sharpening technologies and techniques. But I want to get to the sharpen tool. It will take you to the tool. It'll highlight it. It'll like select it for you. It'll find it. It'll do whatever it needs to do to get you to that tool. 
So just remember when in doubt, don't you like search is right, right? It built into Photoshop. So if I were looking for a lens flare, I get a tutorial on how to use lens flare. Um, I get the lens flares telling me where it is as it's, it's pointing it out in blue at the top of the screen. It's showing me where it would be. Um, and then I get, um, other variations of lens blur, so forth and so on, because I didn't finish typing. So lens flare, and if I go add a lens flare, it'll give me a step-by-step -step tutorial. So it'll actually, actually no, it'll either give me a step-by-step -step tutorial or it'll actually give me a quick action. So it did it the right way. It did it as a smart filter. It, it did the right thing. And then I can go ahead and turn that one off. And it's just, again, walking me through the whole process. So a lot of times when you do a search, it'll either just point out what you're looking for. It'll do it for you. In this case, it just did it for me. It will, um, or give you a tutorial on how to do it. So search is your, like one of your best friends inside of Photoshop. So don't forget that. <clears throat> All right, next up. Let's go in and talk about the next one, which is another one of my favorites, the glyphs panel. All right, let's close this one. And we'll, yeah, we'll leave that on for now. All right, um, one of my favorite features to talk about, and I've talked about this before many times. Let's go ahead and uh, let's type an imaginary name for the stock model. <laughs> this is a stock photo. I don't know this guy's name, but Reverb Mike and I agree his name's probably Fabio. All right, let's go ahead and uh, scale that up. And uh, get out of this. All right, depending on the font, so this is very font, font specific. I'm going to go to the font that I know that has the most options for what I'm about to show you. There we go. All right, good. And it is the, um, this particular font is Bickham Script Pro. It's, it's an Adobe font, so you can get to it. Bickham Script Pro is one of those fonts, and there, there are other fonts that have um, what I'm about to show you, which are called glyphs. But it's the font that I found a while ago that has more glyphs than any other font I've ever seen. Now, what's a glyph? When I, anyone that chooses Bickham Script Pro and types Fabio, it's gonna look identical to what I just did. You size it, change the color, whatever. But that's what, that's what it's gonna look by default. But usually, if it's a open type font, which all the Adobe fonts are now, and depending on who made the font, because different people design different fonts, they have the option to put in as many glyphs as they want, like up to thousands of glyphs. Now, what does that mean? If I um, bring up the glyphs panel, there it is. And I'm going to make sure that I turn on a feature in the glyphs panel called alternate for alternates for selection. Because if you just do the entire font, that's going to show you the entire font. It's not very useful for what we're about to do. But if you do alternates for selection, what that will do is whenever you select a letter, so let's say I select the letter O, then it will give me all the O's in that font. It's like playing, what's the game, Jeopardy or whatever, that shows you all the letters of a particular, um, in a particular phrase that's hidden. So this one has, I don't know, 15, 20 different O's, just the lowercase O. So this is what I mean by, like some fonts will only have one O. Some might have two or three. Some, in this case, Bickham Script Pro has a dozen. Uh, I haven't counted, but at least a dozen. So if I choose this one, then that's the O I get. So especially if you're trying to design your look, your logo, your, um, your special text for your client, and you don't want anyone else to easily have 
that exact same look, glyphs are your friend. Because now, even if they typed Fabio in the exact same font, unless they knew about glyphs, they're never going to get it to look like this. Because they're going to be like, well, where'd that F come from? When I type the capital F, I don't get that. So, for example, let's say I go into the letter B. And these are all the different Bs. So I can pick a different B, like that one. So, glyphs are just awesome. Like <laughs> I can't get enough of these. Because especially when there's a font that's got a ton of them, it makes designing with type so much more fun because you can be you can create something that's totally unique than what the person would get even if they had the exact same font. Now, if uh, if I can get it to work here, let's say I select the letter I. It depends. Like I, mine's not working right now, but Photoshop has had the glyphs panel for a while, but it's also got an option that when you highlight a letter and you get, you, you pull down, not pull down, but you hover over the bottom portion of that selection, it usually pops out with the glyphs to the side. And I'm, it's not working for me right now. I don't know if they took that feature out, but that feature was also kind of useful because it just lets you quickly do it without having to bring up the glyphs panel to do it. All right, um, you're welcome, uh, Fiona. And yeah, Robert, it is cool. It's one of my favorite hidden weapons for design. Because when you're trying to stand out, you want to stand out. You don't want to have something that uh, everyone else created with the Oh, they just match font. Oh, he's using Bickham Script Pro, but mine looks different. Guaranteed. All right, um, so that's it. That's uh, just take advantage of glyphs. And again, uh, all fonts can have glyphs, but they may not all have them because it depends on who, who designed the font. So you don't automatically get a dozen O's or, you know, depending on the font. So each font is going to be different. Most fonts, you're lucky if you get three, four, or five glyphs. You're lucky. Because, and some fonts, you won't have any alternates. You'll just have the letters that are there. But Bickham Script Pro is the one I like to demo this with because it has the most. All right, next up. Um, this is a fun one too. Let's hide the Fabio text for a second. And actually we can leave that on because we're going to go to a different document. Let's go to this one. All right, let's zoom up on this one. Now, what did I do here? So all I did was I created a new document no background, and I put my logo on it. Now, uh, I have my logo in a Creative Cloud library, so I can always drag it onto an image if I need it. So, for example, if we go back to Fabio, and I want to put my logo there, I can just drag it from my Creative Cloud library. There it is. I can scale it. I can drop it in the corner. I can lower the opacity, and um, like so and have like, you know, a kind of a watermark if I need it. However, one of the faster ways of getting your logo onto an image is creating a brush out of your logo. So what I did is there's some restrictions. So um, I think it's either 200 by 200 or 250 by 250. So let's say 200 by 200 to be on the safe side. But I think it's 250. Uh, make an empty document 250 by 250 pixels. Um, put your logo on it, no background because you don't want the background to be part of the brush. So, uh, transparent background, then, uh, next or transparent layer. Next, we're going to go up to the edit menu and we're going to come down to define brush preset. You don't have to select the logo. You don't have to do anything. It just has to be on the layer all by itself. All right. So next, uh, you're welcome. Uh, is that Cami? Cami Marshall? Um, I'm glad you're enjoying the tips. So define brush, define brush preset will bring up a window that where you can name your brush. So I'm going to name this uh, TW logo. And you notice what it's doing. Like it made the logo, and I guess 250 will work because it's 249. So the logo's almost touching the edge. And it's defining a brush that's matching the look of my logo. So when I click OK, there it is. It, it, took, it defined it and took me to it. So now if I were to go back to this one and I turn this layer off and I create a new layer because we would always always want the ability to move this around. 
and I do my uh, alt control and I go bigger. I can make my brush bigger. I can make it smaller. The animation is not going to be in the shape of the brush, but it will be there. And then uh, if I switch my colors and then click, there's my logo. I can click my logo all around all day long because it's on its own layer. So I can always turn that layer off. I can always undo, 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 undo. And um, if I ever needed to scale it, since it's on its own layer, just uh, Command Shift T, PC Control Shift T, and scale it down. And uh, just using anything basically can become a brush. So why not make your logo a brush? And that way you can just click. Uh, where is Adobe Muse? Adobe Muse, sadly, was discontinued, I don't know, like eight, nine, ten years ago. So it's long gone. Time to move on. I had to move on. I'm an Adobe Muse fan, but it's gone. Okay, next up, uh, convert your logo into a brush. So that's just a fun thing to do. And, of course, you didn't lose all your other brushes, but your, your brush will not look like a brush in the brushes panel. Your logo will not look like it looks in the, in the brush panel. That's why it's important to name it. Because if you did, like, if I just looked at this brush, I would never know that that's my logo. Because it takes, and maybe if I look closely, I can see it at the very left edge there. But it takes your logo and, and paints with it. So that's why you would never know. Um, so name it. It's important because otherwise you'll never know which one's which. All right. And then, of course, you can go back to your previous... Um, your previous soft brush, whatever you were using before. Okay, next up, let's go into, um, ours I was sharpened, let's go into, there we go. Um, all right, let's go into the next one. All right, this is, this is kind of a wild one. Let's go to a different photo. I wanna go to this one. All right, zoom out. All right, there's Krista, a model I work with often. Um, and Krista, I want to apply a look. Now, converting to black and white is certainly not new. And there's, I don't know, a dozen, two dozen methods to do it with. Like, everyone has their own trick to do a black and white to make it look a certain way. I personally like the black and white uh, presets in Camera Raw and, and Lightroom. Those are my favorite ways to make a black and white because I like all the options and I can see them right then and there. But if you if you want to create that unique looking black and white or just different tone of your photo that you just won't see everywhere, then you're going to love this. Now, first things first, Photoshop introduced a couple versions back a whole host of gradients, like just tons and tons of very beautifully designed gradients. So if you needed gradients before and you were like, you were just stuck on trying to make your own presets or make your own, or you were buying presets or any of that, just remember that you've now got more gradient presets than you'll ever, ever need. So thank you Photoshop team for giving us all these beautiful presets. When they did this though, they took away a set of photographic gradient presets. Like they're not there anymore. They're not in the list anymore. Most people never knew they were there to begin with. That's probably why they took them away. So to get those back, the first thing you're gonna do is go, you're gonna bring up the gradients panel and you're gonna go to the menu and you're gonna come down to legacy gradients. <laughs> that, so they didn't take them out of the program yet. They just took them out of the, uh, the main view. But as soon as you choose legacy gradients from this menu, what that will do is it will put them back at the bottom. Uh, there we go. The bottom of this panel. And here they are, legacy gradients. And in that list of legacy gradients is this category, photographic toning. Right? Like, who knew that was there? So what's photographic toning do? Well, it's a, it's a set of gradients designed for photographers. And when you want to use it, you simply go to your, um, your um, adjustment layers and you choose, 
the one I'm looking for, gradient map. So go to your adjustment layers, create a new gradient map. That will create a probably awful looking gradient on your image. However, in that gradient map pop-up, you can go to all the different gradients that are here, including legacy, photographic toning. And now you can have some beautiful looking photos by just choosing the different toning for your, like, for example, that's, that's a black and white, but it's not ever going to be the black and white you would get by converting to black and white because it's toning it with a gradient first. So it's just going to give you that look, that professional look you see. And you're like, how do they get it to look quite like that? And it's because they're using a method similar to this. All right. Um, <laughs> wow, you have to be a detective talent to find all these gems. I, I know it's like, and I could probably do another 10 and another 10 because there's so many little things in Photoshop that are buried that you might not ever stumble across. And if you've stumbled across it, you wouldn't know what it necessarily how to use it or what it's for because it's not obvious. So um, these photographic um, gradients, I expect to see lots of lot more beautiful photo, black and whites from you now because you have a different way of toning them than just a simple convert to black and white. All right, so that was number nine, number 10, and we're right on schedule here. Um, number 10, and let's put these away. All right, number 10 is, uh, I need my blue angel shot. Let's go here. There we go. Zoom out. Okay, this is, is, this is a classic one. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite kind of like hidden little things about Photoshop. Photoshop has had content aware fill for a while. And then, uh, I can't remember if it, I think before, before or after, I can't remember which one was first, Content Aware Fill or Content Aware Scale. I can't remember which one came first, I think it was Fill. But Content Aware Scale, like Content Aware Fill, looks at the pixels in the image and tries to scale them without it being noticed that they were scaled. In other words, without destroying the image. The problem with scaling an image though, is you usually end up stretching everything. So let's say I wanted to take my Blue Angel shot and I wanted to spread it across a banner, like my YouTube channel or a Facebook banner or just a banner, like I need something wide. So I could go in and change the canvas size. So let's go do that. Uh, let's, first of all, let's do that. And then let's go to canvas size, um, image, canvas size. Right now it's 6,000 pixels wide, 6,048 pixels wide. Let's make it 10,000 pixels wide. Okay, and I, I'm going to tell it to, um, I will throw the image to the left. Okay, great. So now we got this 10,000 pixel wide image canvas, but we need our image to go across it. Now the problem though, is if you free transform it and you scale it to fit, that's great, but then you're going to cut off part of the image. We've been there. We've all been there. Like you need to scale something, but you can't scale it because the proportions don't match and it doesn't work out right. However, if I do a scale and I hold down my shift key to stretch it, then that's exactly what it does. And if you do this, we will just cringe at you. Like, please don't do this. Don't distort your, your, um, your subject. And I see this sadly all the time, especially with people. They make the people too skinny or too wide because they're trying to fit the photo into a certain space. It drives me nuts. So if you want to know what one of my triggers is, show me an image where you've stretched it. <laughs> and that will trigger it. All right. Um, anyway, let's undo that before my eyes fall out. So next, this is what we're going to do. We're going to tell Photoshop that the planes matter. I'm gonna tell Photoshop, don't mess with the planes, protect the jets. So what we're gonna do is uh, select subject and that will select the subject. And it got some of the jet stream, but not all of it, but that's okay. I don't care if the jet stream is kind of, gets kind of stretched. And if I really cared, then I would go ahead and brush it in and, and make sure that gets paint selected too. But for the sake of demo. Now we're gonna go up to our, um, our, 
image menu. No, we're going to go up to our. I want to select menu. Sorry, I was drawing a blank there. I'm going to go to our select menu and we're going to choose save selection. Now, when you choose save selection, that will pop up a, a thing asking you, okay, you're saving this selection. What do you want to call it? I'm going to call it Blue Angels. All right, so now I've got the Blue Angels selection saved. Now I can deselect now. I don't need it selected anymore. So that's it. Select whatever it is you want to protect that you don't want stretched. Save it as a selection. Name it. Because when you go into Content Aware Scale, which is what we're going to do next, uh, Edit, Content Aware Scale, Content Aware Scale, there we go. You will have an option of what mask to protect. So by default, it'll be on none and it'll be grayed out if you didn't save a selection. But because we saved a selection, we can choose it. So protect the blue angels. Do not let anything happen to them. So now when I hold down my shift key to stretch this, it just does the right thing. It does not affect the jets, the blue angels. So I can make that as long, as wide as I need it to be. If I needed that to be a more tall image to go maybe on a magazine. Now I can get to a point where it will start affecting the image because I'm encroaching on the space of the subject. But maybe I go here and maybe here. Nope, too much. Okay, so yeah, I do have a point to where you can't go anymore. But anyway, that's kind of where we started. We can go that far in or we can go that far out. We can keep going out and it will protect it. All right, LOL, Rick says, I needed this last week. Yep, protect uh, image in content aware scale, and you can then get what you want without messing up your subject. Now, where you will see this happen a lot, let me get out of my library. Let's go here. I need to make a new one for 2023. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Let's see, I had one here that I would like to try it on. And those were the 10 things, by the way. We got all 10 in since I got a couple of minutes left. Let's see here. I'm finding everything except what I want. Dun, 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 dun. All right, let's, if it's not in this library, I know where it is. All right, uh, this is just another example, but let me switch libraries. I think I know which one it's in. It must be in... We scroll, we scroll, we scroll. Now I don't see that library. <laughs> Hang on. Hold on. Maybe it's this one. Nope. It should be a what's new in Photoshop. Did I just not see it? Oh, it's driving me crazy. I can't find it. Anyway, if I don't find it this pass, I'll just grab something else. All right, let's see what's in here. We can try it on this one. All right, same thing. Let's zoom out. Let's uh, convert that to a layer. Let's do a select subject. Let's uh, save that selection. And deselect. Let's change our canvas size. Let's just, I don't know, make it triple. All 
Not, not image size, canvas size. I was like, wait, that looks wrong. Layer, image, canvas size, not image size. Sorry about that. 15,000. And we'll just put them, keep them in the middle. And then we'll do our content aware uh, scale. And we'll make sure we protect the deer. So it, it automatically even selected that uh, channel uh, for you. So if you don't hold down the shift key, it's just going to scale. So what you want it to do is you want to hold down the shift key so it, I'm sorry, it's going to scale proportionally. You want to hold down the shift key, shift key so it scales the, um, the actual background. Now, in this case, there are some things that got stretched that probably shouldn't. So this doesn't work across the board unless you protect, oh, undo, unless you protect all the things that needed protecting. So in this case, I might have gone in and protected some of these flowers too so that they don't get stretched because they look like they're stretched. So you would basically just go in and add those to your mask and that way um, those get protected as well. So things that you don't want to be protect, stretched, protect. Things that are okay to stretch, you're okay to stretch. So, uh, and I'm out of time. So with that said, thanks everyone. I hope you got something out of today. And today was a fun day for me because I was like showing hidden things that people are like, wow, I didn't know that was there. All right. Cheers, everyone. Stay tuned for the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge. We'll catch you next week when I'm editing your images, your user submitted images. Stay tuned.